seems to be better. Well, as you know, every network has lots of problems. All right. So there they are, and I will attempt to uh, mute them. All right. All right. And hopefully that will work out. I'll turn down the sound anyway so it won't bother us. And I do have Twitter open so those guys can communicate with me if they need to. Sometimes the chat seems to pop up too. So this, this uh, remote viewing thing, I'm getting a little better at it. All right. Anyway, so um, I shouldn't call it remote viewing. That's ESP. Anyway, so, all right, um, so here's other ways to get information. Cookies and web bugs. Cookies, of course, uh, started, Netscape invented this. HTTP has a serious limitation. It is a stateless protocol. If you send a request to a server and you get a page, and you send another request and get a page, it doesn't have any way to remember who you are. Originally, HTTP was just to publish static information, like a printed newspaper page. There was no accounts, no login, no social media, no nothing. You just view pages and everybody sees the same page. And that's what HTTP was designed for. But then people said, wouldn't it be cool if we could have stuff like email and Facebook and chat rooms and guest books where you log in and you're seeing stuff that's different than what other people are seeing. And in order to do that, it has to remember who you are somehow. And Netscape invented the magic cookie for this purpose. And the magic cookie is these text files that are stored on your machine. So let's take a look at them. Um, if I go to, let's go to, uh, say, Firefox, see if I can find them. Uh, you guys might have to help me. Uh, is it preferences? I think it is. Then content, maybe. Uh, privacy, maybe. Tracking. All right. I'm going to see cookies. I want to see the cookies. And let's see if I saved in my slides how to find blue and cookies. Oh, good. Tools, options, privacy, show cookies. Tools, options, privacy. Yeah, it looks like it's, oh, there. Remove individual cookies. I remember this. There, now you can see the cookies. Here they are. So I have a Bing cookie. Let's see what a Bing cookie looks like. Um, there. This is a pretty good example for a cookie. It's just a long random number. That's what cookies are supposed to be. If you want to remember who somebody is, you just store some code number on their machine and you put it on your server in some database so it knows that number means Sam. Then when they come back, you know who they are. But if somebody steals the cookie off the machine, they can't read it. Amateurs will put stuff in there like your username, your credit card number, your password, stuff like that, or sequential numbers so I can guess what cookie goes to other people and get in their account. You know, but a pros, which looks like Bing did it right, which is what I expected, they just have a long random number here. And it means nothing to anybody except Bing. So anyway, um, that's what's put on your machine. If you read the New York Times, the New York Times cookies are pretty awful. The New York Times has a um, limitation of 10 articles you can view before you have to pay for a subscription in a month. And what they do is they store a cookie for every article that has the headline in plain text. So every time you go to the New York Times, your machine sends in plain text the headline the last 10 articles you read there. And I was pretty unhappy when I found that. I didn't bother reporting it to them because I know nobody will care. But it is a privacy violation. I mean, this means if I'm reading articles about something and I don't want the whole world to know what I'm reading about, then it's kind of rude to spew that out unencrypted every time I go back there. But anyway, um, that gets you into the room, realm of the uh, paywalls. People want you to pay to view content, and it's very easy to defeat that stuff. Almost all of them use cookies on your machine to store that you've already seen three articles this month. So you can just delete the cookies and see more. You can just open a private browser window and see everything with no limit. You know, most of those paywalls are paper thin because they really don't want to block people very efficiently. They just want to kind of remind them you're supposed to be paying them money. Anyway, um, so... Web bugs are nastier, and they are everywhere. Web bugs are, see, if you load a page, you load the HTML, that's the main page. Now then, the HTML will include things like image tags. So it has to make a separate request to load the image, a separate request to load the JavaScript, the CSS, the Flash videos. Everything on your page is another request, to where it can easily be 50 or 100 requests to make a page. So what you do is you put an image on the page that you can't see. So DoubleClick invented this, called third-party cookies. So you're trying to see a page like Google. And when you go there, DoubleClick pays Google to put a cookie on their page. And what they do is they put an image on their page that is a one-by-one -one pixel transparent GIF. So it is invisible, but it means your browser will make a request to load the image. And the request will go to DoubleClick's server. So when you think you're talking to Google, your browser sends a request to DoubleClick. 
Now, if you send a request to a server, the server is allowed to put a cookie on your machine. That's how it works. The reply can have a cookie in that header portion and it's stored on your machine. So double click, it can also read the previous cookies from that domain. So if you visit Google, double click loads an image and that means they can read the double click cookies and change the double click cookies. So if they manage to get popular enough to put those images all over the web, they can follow everybody and see what you're doing and that's exactly what happened. Double click invented this technique, it's the original form of spyware. They can see everything everybody is doing. This is enormously valuable. This means you can buy an ad, advertising trucks, and you can pay people money. I only want to show this to people who visited a truck magazine within the last day. And they know who's visited a truck magazine online in the last day. And your ad will only appear on those pages. That's worth a lot of money. And it's not all bad, of course, because instead of being annoyed by a thousand ads for random stuff you don't care about, you'll only see 10 ads for products that are related to you. But it does mean that you have no privacy. And like people worry about the NSA and the government spying on you, but Facebook and Google know everything. And your ISP would know everything if they were more technically competent because they should be able to see everything you do. And um, so anyway, Google's targeting ads and tracking everybody with these web bugs. And you can see them with Ghostry. So I put Ghostry on here and it's good, clean fun. Um, how about I wait, Kahoot only has three of them. Kahoot has site analytics, which is Google, and one advertising tracker. But if you want to go to CNN, that's probably the king of commerce. Okay, here comes CNN. And here they are, 1, 10, 16, 23, 25. It's going to get up to about 50, 60. These are all the tracking cookies on CNN.com. 67 so far, and I think they're still loading. So here's all the people. Here's just the A's. Amazon, Adobe, Bing, Criteo, DoubleClick. These are all the advertising agencies that have paid CNN to put cookies on this site to track what you're doing. DoubleClick invented the technique. They were the king of it. Google bought them. Google makes all their money from this. This is their killer app. This is the only reason Google has any money. 99% more of their entire revenue comes from this process. This is what ended advertising largely in magazines and newspapers and pretty much is killing off the paper print industry entirely because of Google. The way Uber's disrupting taxis, Google stole the money from all print media with this technique because it used to be you would pay someone to make a beautiful picture of people dancing and smoking cigarettes, then you put it in like Time Magazine, then you hope you sell more cigarettes. But you really have no idea how many more cigarettes you sold and Google made it scientific. You put the ad, you know how many people saw the ad, you know how many people clicked on it to buy the product. You're not wasting your money guessing anymore. You're, you scientifically know that this ad had a 2% conversion rate, this ad had a 4% conversion rate. You can totally mathematically figure out the most efficient way to spend your advertising budget and get more sales. And magazines and can, television cannot compete with that. And so an enormous amount of advertising moved from print and TV over to Google, and that's where they get the money to pay for everything. And you see, it's pretty popular. Many, many, many people are doing it here. All these people have arranged with CNN to add content to their site. Anyway, so Ghostry lets you see it, and that's paying for all the free products on the internet. Anyway, then there's domain names. You have a DNS server at every company, or you lease one on the clouds. If you have someplace like ccsf.edu, they'll have various servers, like www and hills and, and fog and mail, there's various servers in our domain, and some database has to have those names and their corresponding IP addresses, and that's our DNS server. So you can find, we resolve one name with just the command line dig. So if I dig ccsf.edu, it'll tell me that ccsf.edu is that, that address. This is an A record that gives you its normal IP version 4 address. Now if I dig, um, for name servers at ccsf.edu, it'll tell me what our DNS servers are. And it found one here, which is kind of rude. Let's try for the SOA. Um, that's the start of authority name server. And I got the answer, which is this one, changed from when I used to know it. Root. So now, if I can dig in front of the authoritative name server, I can dig at that one for hills ccsf.edu and if it responds and it did respond there's a question uh, no it did not answer me okay it may be public not available I wonder if it's at root.ccsf.edu let me try that and then I'll just not worry about it 
All right. Um, anyway, let's try others. There's public servers that answer everybody, like Google has one at 8.8.8.8. And here's actually one for you conspiracy theorists. You can use 8.8.8.8 for your DNS server. Google keeps it. It's very powerful, very fast. You can resolve names really fast, and it's great. That means if you do that, Google knows everything you do. Right? Every single domain name you go to is being resolved their servers. Google promises they are not keeping that data. They are not targeting ads based on that data. I just wonder, this is like a giant pile of money just sitting there, and they're not taking the money. How long can this possibly last? Millions of queries a second. All that could be used to target ads. They know your IP address, they know where you went. It's better than a cookie. At least it's, anyway, um, that's Google servers, and you can find out for any of them where they are. So every domain has a record, and you can ask any server on the internet, any recursive server, DNS server where something is, and it will go ask until it finds it. And the ultimate repository of the data is the start of authority server. Every company has one. You have a primary DNS server. That's your start of authority. That's where the origin of the information is. And all the rest are copies of that data. So if you want to go for something that does not exist, um, if I dig at 8.8.8, .8 .8, for hills2 or hills4.ccsf.edu, I will get no answer. And that tells me that Google doesn't have any record for it. And since it's a recursive server at Google, it presumably asked other people until it was sure. But ultimately, it had to ask queries until it got to the start of authority for ccsf.edu. That is the only machine that can tell you for sure that something does not exist. All anybody else can say is it's not in my database, but my database is not complete. It has a timeout here. So the last, I know I have a whole class about this stuff, so I'm not gonna push it any further. Let me just point out, here the time is 74793. And if I do it again, it's now 72662. That's because Google is a cluster. This is the number of seconds before the record times out. Each, each record times out, and when it times out, it throws it away, so it does refresh periodically. So what you're really seeing are copies cached from server to server, most of the time. So there's how I found the start of authority at MIT, which is bitsy.mit.edu. At least it was when I did this. And if you find the start of authority, you can do a zone transfer to get all the data off it if it's a misconfigured server. Um, this, most people know about this now. They've turned it off. The purpose of a zone transfer is when you put up a new server and you want to, because you have more DNS queries than you can handle with your load. You want another server to share the load. You put up a server. Then you do a zone transfer from your start of authority to that one. And now it gets a copy of the database, so it can hand out queries. But your whole world shouldn't be able to do zone transfers and get all the data off the server. That is only for your other servers. But a lot of people did allow these when your book, the first version of your book was written. MIT let it happen. Um, you'll find it if you have a Microsoft domain server. It's just right here in the properties of your domain server. You can say allow zone transfer to any server, and that was the default in like Windows 2000 and Windows NT. That's why people got used to being able to do this just everywhere. Now, it's not the default anymore, I think. Anyway, now you can specify only let certain IP addresses do zone transfers, and that's a lot better. You can also block it at your firewall. Anyway, so that's the game of um, DNS. You know, very simple stuff. We're doing a lot more stuff in the DNS class and the advanced hacking class. So social engineering is the most powerful attack. It is the hardest to patch. Um, con men down through the ages have been able to just talk people into handing them their money, their secrets, their keys, and everything else, and this continues. And it happens to be big on the internet, too. Uh, Kevin Mitnick invented the term social engineering. This was his big skill. He was primarily a phone freaker back in the early 90s, and he led the FBI to Mary Chase when he was 17. They hunted him. He was number one most wanted guy in America for a year or two, and the FBI could not catch him, and he ran them around like idiots. He rerouted their phones so they were calling each other. He made insulting messages. He just played all the typical teenage pranks until they finally caught him, and then he had to spend nine months in solitary because the convicting judge actually believed that he could whistle into a telephone and launch nuclear weapons. And that's what I mean about the hackers are the new witches. An incredible number of people believe that we have magic powers and we can do anything. It is disturbing, and it's one huge issue in this business. If you know something about security, people are forever going to view you with suspicion, like you are a witch and you can do magic and you can turn me into a frog at any moment and I, I'm scared of you. And they really believe that. A lot of people believe that we can just do anything. So, the staff will be tough to give up, like, just losing 
know someone. Oh, you know, Greg from the other department of the I read it. They do things. They, you, it just depends on how good you are at convincing people. You have to be smooth. Some people have it. There, there are people that just live off this. I've known several men who never get a job, and they just have an endless succession of girlfriends who will put up with everything and pay for their money, and they just are able to say the right thing and fool somebody for a while and get their money, and then they have to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. There's a lot of people who do this to your life. It just If you have a certain uh, – if you're able to – Say the things and appear confident and stuff. It can be amazing. So let me show you this Kevin Mitnick video. This is Kevin Mitnick. Now he's out. Now he can talk about what he did. His dad, he's done his time in prison. So, okay. Years ago, there's a Hollywood Central office in Los Angeles. And a friend of mine, um, a guy named Steve Rose at the time, was also a home freaker. And we decided we wanted to take a self guided tour of the Central office. The phone off. So it was around 2 30 in the morning on a Saturday. And we had door codes all different offices in Los Angeles. And we just let ourselves in. And we're roaming around the Hollywood CEO and about on the third floor. And then all of a sudden, this big guy, security guard, approaches us and goes, Excuse me. Yeah. Do you have any ID? And I go, like, Sure, one moment. And I go to my pocket and I say, Oh, I must have left my uh, ID in the car. Go get it, I'll be right back. He goes, No, he goes, Who's this guy? And I go, Well, he's just a friend of mine, and I want to take him on the tour. He's never seen a central office. He goes, At 2 30 in the morning? I said, Yeah, we just got up in the movie, and my friend just told me he's going to work for fun. And so I think I just take him on the tour. And he goes, Where are you going? I said, Why don't we go to Cosmo Center in San Diego? He goes, Who's your supervisor? And they told him the name of the supervisor, and incidentally, it was the correct name of the person in San Diego Cosmo Center. He goes, well, you have to come, you guys have to come with us. So he escorts us to the elevator, and I know on the ninth floor is the switching control center, and that's where there's people up there because that office is made. So you end up going and getting escorted up to the ninth floor, and there's about five or six people around, and uh, the security guard is telling me the story. I found these two guys roaming around our building. This guy doesn't have ID. Let's find out what's going on. So one of the other uh, supervisors, you know, security guy, he goes, what's your supervisor name? And then he gave it to me, I said, well, listen, you can't wake her up. He look, it's 2 30 in the morning. If you want, I'll go to my car, we'll go get my ID, and I'll be right back. Of course, I have no plans to come back. <laughs> so he says, no, we're calling your supervisor. So he picks up a book, uh, some sort of intercompany director, and then he calls, you know, this phone telephone was there. But apparently, he had found some sort of notes or whatever, listing the supervisors on the phone. He calls the supervisor, 2 30 in the morning, Saturday. He goes, Listen, I found one of your employees, Steve, running around one of our offices. And he says he works for you. Uh huh. Oh, you want to talk to him? Sure. And so he hands me the phone. And I go, Hey, Sally, how are you? I'm really sorry that you were woken up. And I, you know, I normally would never take a friend on a tour of a central office. And she, as I'm speaking, she's going, she said, Who are you? Who are you? And I go, Yeah, I, and by the way, Tuesday, we'll definitely, we still have that meeting for that report, correct? And she goes, Who are you? Who are you? And I'm pressing the phone in my ear. So, the other people in the room can't hear what she said. She's all listening nice to the conversation. And I'm like having a calm conversation with her. And I said, Listen, okay, um, you know, I'm just going to take my friend around for about 15 more minutes and we'll leave, and I'll, I'll see you on Tuesday. And I, I, and I went over and I walked about, well, it was like one or yeah, about two steps, and I hung up the phone. And I go, are you satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's social engineer. And he was the expert. He still is. He's a very nice guy. I don't know if you can meet him and stuff. Um, he did his time. Now he's a legitimate security awareness guy. You can't get him to talk, though. He, it costs money to get him to talk. He's got an agent and everything. He's kind of a celebrity. But anyway, um, so another one was H.B. Gary. H.B. Gary is a company that makes root kits for the U.S. military. They're a military contractor. And they decided to spin off a branch called H.P. Gary Federal that would uh, sell information to federal agencies like the FBI. And the guy in charge of this decided that he was going to find Anonymous. Now, this was around 2011, 2012, when Anonymous was hacking everybody. And he made a tool 
that would scrape Twitter and Facebook and, and IRC channels and everything. And the idea was when one guy says something and he's like Fluffy Bunny 3, and then two seconds later, Joe Green says it over here, that must be the same guy. And when 20 seconds later, these three people say it, they must be part of his gang. So we're going to correlate all these tweets and Facebook posts, and we're going to figure out who Anonymous is, because whoever first says, we just hacked something, here's the data, is the guy that did it. And whoever repeats that, that's his gang. So he made some kind of computer tool to do that, and he claimed he had found Anonymous. And so to punish him, they hacked him. Um, and they totally destroyed him, um, because he was totally unsafe. So they took, they found an open SQL injection on his mail server. You'll be doing that in the project. So you have a SQL injection, you can take over the server, which they did. So now they could send email inside the company that appeared to come from people in the company. Now the CEO is Greg Hoagland. So they sent email from Greg to the administrator saying, I'm traveling. Um, will you please open a port so I can remote in? He said, oh, I forgot the password. They found his old email. They found the old password for the administrator. They said, gee, is it still this? Or did you change it? Oh, why don't you change it something else? So he totally got in. This is pure social engineering, no technical thing at all, except the SQL injection. He said, please open it, give me a password. Hey, I'm in, thanks, it's working now. And then he's in the servers. After they were in, they stole all the data, dumped it publicly, wiped out all the servers, wiped out his iPad, destroyed everything to punish him for attacking Anonymous. And it was so bad, the company was driven out of business. They paid $6,000 for a booth at RSA, and they didn't even show up. They put a poster up saying they'd be receiving death threats from the community, and they didn't dare show their face. And that guy went into hiding for about six months and then came back, the original CEO. I saw him at DEF CON, uh, one after that. He was wandering around. Um, but maybe you don't hear it anymore. But in 2012, emotions were very, very high. The Snowden stuff, I think, had come out before that, some other stuff related to it. People were just really, really, really angry. And, and people were hacking everybody and DDoSing everybody and threatening each other with horrible things. And it was kind of a scary, crazy time. It's calmed down since then. Yeah. Really? Emailing her images with masks on saying, you know, your address, repeating it. That's interesting. Is that like just cyberbullying or is that against the law? It's, it is cyberbullying and it's also against the law. And the punishment is actually quite severe. It's stalking and stuff. Really the punishment is severe, but it's very hard to catch them. Yeah. So um, not very many of them got punished. But what happened is the serious ones that actually hack into like government servers and dump data, they pretty much got caught or scared into hiding. Um, so, but if they're being harassed by individuals, that's the problem. Right now, being harassed on social media is such a huge problem, especially for women, that nobody has much clue what to do. Prosecuting individual people is kind of hopeless. What's coming? And one of my students, I don't think he's here, one of my students in the class got a job, I think, at Twitter on this. Um, they're trying to build artificial intelligence spam filters to try to block that stuff on the social media. They need some kind of sensor that can tell when speech is offensive or not. And it's not just by looking for certain words, but something smarter than that. Every social media platform is now working on that. So within a couple of years, I think we'll have some kind of thing that prevents you from having death threats on Twitter. It's, it's, it's yeah. a yeah, it is very frustrating. I know what you're saying. A lot of people get harassed on the internet and they want to do something about it. It used to be spam email they get mad about. And this is, of course, the fundamental nature of the internet. People do rotten things just because it's almost impossible for you to punch them back and they can pretty much get away with it. And they're, we're struggling to find a good solution for that. But certainly a lot of people have trouble. Anyway, so to social engineer people, you can persuade them that it's a good idea to do the stupid thing. You can intimidate them. You threaten them with some kind of harm. I'm going to hack you. I'm going to punch you in the face. That's what the San Francisco system administrator did. He had four armed robbery felonies. The people that were supposed to work with him were afraid that he would kill them. So they just let him do anything he wanted. Um, then there's coercion, where you force them to do it for threat of harm. And then there's blackmail, where you threaten to reveal their secrets if they don't do what you want. Um, so this is this, the main security threat. Your people are vulnerable. It's very hard to patch them. Um, you can send them to training and stuff, but you know that's usually the most efficient way to overcome any security boundaries to just get the people to hand it over. And so social engineers are people who study human behavior and they learn how to do this. They've been around forever. Um, I know it, you can be taught social engineering. Police are taught interrogation techniques, which is a form of social engineering. They learn human body language. There are tricks like you arrange for their chair to be uncomfortable. You arrange for you to be higher than them. And then you start 
noticing how they're reacting and how their eyes move. And there comes a point when someone feels ashamed and humiliated when they just start imitating the person. You move their body, they'll move their body the same way. Then you're controlling them and dominating them. It's all unconscious. And it's so bad that there's a frequent problem that innocent people confess to crimes under police interrogation because the social engineering is so effective, they will feel persuaded to say whatever the guy expects to hear. And so it is very effective. So you're kind of exposing like the show live microns for expression and stuff like that. Oh, there's a bunch of them. There's a movie about Frank Abdigail. Yeah, there's a lot of people. So anyway, here's other techniques. You convince them that this is an emergency and the usual rules don't apply for some reason. You convince them that I will give you something. If you give me that, just bribe them or otherwise do a favor for them and they'll do you a favor. Uh, you convince them the status quo. This is very common. Say everybody does it. Nobody cares about this. Everybody knows everybody's password. Everybody locks the door open. Don't worry about it. That's often true, by the way. Um, then there's kindness. You say, I'm really going to get fired. Or, I, my poor grandmother will die without her medicine and I'm going to get fired. Don't tell the boss. And then you convince them you have a special position like you're off golfing with the CEO right now and he's going to sign the deal. But if you make me wait till tomorrow to pass some security check, then we'll lose the deal and I'll tell him it was your fault and that kind of stuff. These are all very good. So the way to prevent this, you got to train your staff to not believe what they're told. Um, when people call, they have to not believe them unless they can verify that they're a customer somehow before they hand out any data. You have to have drills. You have to have internal pen testers like the military has internal um, security that try to trick your staff. Uh, one of the jobs several of my friends have in this business is they send spam to their own company to, with a link to trick them into clicking on the link so they can tell who clicked on the link and then they can like, send those guys to training or fire them or punish them or somehow convince them to knock off clicking on the links. Um, there, there's one social engineering template. It always gets my attention because I did a case for a major televangelist industry. I was working for the Federal Trade Commission under... There was a major televangelist that would just lie to people to get money out of them. And they had a template like this. It was very impressive. They had a database that said when they called to them last, facts about these people, what lies they told them next time. So we called this family. They have three dogs and they have a father who was in the military. So I told them that we're building a pet hospital in Vietnam and we're building a military hospital in China. So next time, tell them that we added another wing to the hospital, call them in six months show them a picture of a dog we supposedly cured or something. And they have, they have these plans of what lie to tell them next time to get more money out of them. It was all scientific. And they had this kind of template coming up on the screen. So the callers are looking at the lies that you've been told and the right lies to tell you next time and recording just like a help desk, what the result was of talking to you this time and what they recommend next time they should say to get more money out of you. So that's the game. Um, this is called, uh, Business intelligence and customer relationship management is the technical term for this stuff these days. And of course, it has a good side and a bad side. The, your cable company should have a trouble ticket and a record. And they can say, wait, you're calling us and you called us last month and you called us the month before that with this problem. They're supposed to be able to see all that to help deal with their customers better. But it, of course, can be used for evil as well. So that's the game here. Uh, DEF CON made a social engineering contest starting in 2010. Um, it's very popular. These people are in a, a booth calling, and you can hear both sides of the conversation. And they're, they have a, a task, which is call these five companies and convince them to open a web page that, will, that could have put malware on their machine and see who's going to fall for it. And the first time they did it, out of 135 companies, 130 fell for it. The only five that didn't fall for it are ones where women answered the phone. Because, uh, and they didn't have a... I haven't heard an official scientific explanation here, but it seems to me incredibly obvious. I don't know if anything has changed in the world, but when I was a young man, men would go out with women and lie to them and pretend to be important and pretend to be rich. And women would just sit there and listen to this nonsense and figure out if they were lying. It was a common activity. And the net result is men pretty much turn into braggarts. If you just flatter them, they'll babble all their secrets to try to impress you. And women pretty much turned into lie detectors. This is, anyway... That's the result. You, they have very little luck talking women into doing stupid things over the phone. So one simple, that's why I keep saying we need more women in security. All the security officers being men is a vulnerable situation. <laughs> we need both people because uh, men have a serious systematic weakness. And I imagine women might have weaknesses too, but they would be different weaknesses. Diversity will make us stronger. Anyway, shoulder surfers, watch you type on the keyboard. I watch students get my password now and then this way. One guy did it with his phone, recorded a video of me in the lab typing in my password. Uh, this is a good trick. This is how they get your pin at the ATM. They put a camera and a fake 
uh, shim on there so they get the mag stripe when you put in your card and the camera gets your pin by recording a video. You can also do it with binoculars and telescopes and mirrors from a distance. Uh, you can do it by watching their hand move. Um, in UC Berkeley a few years ago, they figured out how to do it from a microphone. If you're typing in a chat room and your microphone is turned on, then the sound of the same finger hitting twice is different than right hand, left hand, and that's different than this finger, that finger. So they can figure out a lot about your password from the sound. They don't get the whole password, but they get enough information to make guessing it much faster. All right, and um, so if you want to prevent this, you have to um, not let people stand behind you, not have shiny objects behind you, you know. Um, change your monitors so they're facing, to, so that behind you is a wall and things like that. And uh, change your password if you think somebody's got it. These are rules. Dumpster diving used to be a good way to start social engineering. You would steal their trash, and in there you would find old manuals and technical manuals and notepads and all sorts of good stuff. Um, this is not that common anymore because now people dump everything in their life on Facebook and you can just troll that which keeps you cleaner than digging through the trash. But, but both of them, people dump information and they don't think someone's going to find it. That happened this week. Deloitte got hacked and a bunch of people were just putting Deloitte passwords in their public GitHub repositories and blogs and everything. Um, people put things in the stupidest places and think nobody's going to see it. Hey, years ago, I found many things in Oh yeah, people dump everything in there. That's why another a countermeasure here is you should be burning or shredding stuff. If you pay Iron Mountain, they will drive a truck to your work and burn it right there in front of you and stick the ashes in there and haul it off. And that's what you do if you're serious about not letting people steal stuff from your trash. Uh, CBC, the pharmacy chain, had to pay a $2 million HIPAA settlement, HIPAA fine, because they were dumping patient records in unlocked dumpsters unshredded. And they had to pay a fine for that because that was considered unsafe. Uh, several years ago, I remember they had um, an election, a presidential election, and they found a whole box of ballots floating in the bay. That was, I don't think they ever got to the bottom of that either. But anyway, um, you can follow people through closed doors. You know, they open the door with their card and they let you through. You follow behind them. If you're just sort of pushy and they don't want to confront someone, they might just let you do it. Maybe they'll do it if you ask them. You could also make an ID that looks kind of right but doesn't work and say, mine's broken, but i got to get to work. Let me in. Uh, this tends to work. You can prevent it perhaps with turnstiles, although anybody that uses BART knows how much good turnstiles do. But anyway, the idea of the turnstiles, it's supposed to only lets one person through. A much better solution is a man trap that's more expensive where you're working in a room like an elevator. You go in one door, they're in there, and the other door won't open until you do some second authentication. Um, and then there's phishing, of course. You send people emails or text messages, and in, they, they call it phishing because you're sending them something and there's a hook. If they click on the link or run the attachment, you get them, which is what you're doing in Project 4. You make malware, you send it to the target. If they run that file, you got them. Um, all right. And I've got some cahoots. I got seven minutes left. I think I'm going to stop and restart the share so it doesn't run out during the cahoot. It's pretty easy to stop and restart.